Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining our multi-photon film session. Thank you very much for your interest in this presentation. And thanks also to Amasi Periasami and his crew and to the entire organization committee for giving me the opportunity to talk about our data analysis here. So the talk, as the title says, will be about FLIM data analysis. Maybe some of you will already know them. In fact, the software is around already for 20 years now. So you may wondering why I am giving this presentation now and not 20 years ago. The reason is simply all the time we added this and this and little innovations and little improvements all the time constantly to our software, but it was never enough material for a presentation in this conference. Now, the situation is a bit different because we actually now have a new generation. It is a combination, hmm, sorry. It's the, the new generation of our software is a combination of time domain analysis and phaser plot. It uses maximum likelihood estimation of the decay data and it runs parallel data processing on a GPU. So this all in all, this may be not a big leap for mankind, but it can be a big step for a flim user. So don't expect, please, that I give you a, a tour through all the through all the functions of our software. And it's not not my style to give product presentations. But what I'm planning here is just to give you an impression about the functions and the algorithmic principles which are behind this data analysis. So what are FLIM data? First point. I believe you have never seen something like this, a presentation of raw data of FLIM. So what you see here, it's, it's a photon distribution and FLIM data, in other words, are photon distribution over the image coordinates X and Y. And in every pixel, you have a fluorescence decay curve in a large number of time channels of, the, of this pixel. So what you, the, all the peaks you see here are actually fluorescence decay functions in the individual pixels of the software. So now the task of the FLIM software is to convert this ugly photon distribution into a beautiful FLIM image. We have it here. So the FLIM image, in other words, represents the image of the sample in a false color representation where the color represents the fluorescence lifetime. In most cases in biology, the fluorescence decay curves are not single exponential as, as you see here. And in that cases, you may be interested to, to see images of the individual decay components. Of course, the software does also this. These are lifetimes uh, images of the lifetimes of the decay components. And these are the amplitudes of the components. So full information about the decay curves. So the question is now, how can we determine the decay parameters? So if I say, just determine the fluorescence lifetime of a decay profile, it sounds easy, but in fact, what we are recording is not exactly the fluorescence decay function. It's the, the fluorescence is excited by laser pulses of non-zero width, and it's detected by a detector of finite speed. So in fact, the, measure, the measured waveform is a convolution of the real decay function with the instrument response function. So what is an instrument response function? What is convolution? Most of you probably have seen the convolution integral. This is pure mathematics and it's, it's nice mathematics, but the integral doesn't take you, uh, tell you exactly what's actually going on, in, on here in, in, in terms of, of, of signal processing. So let's assume we have a laser pulse. The laser pulse excites fluorescence. And we can assume the laser pulse as broken down in a large number of small pulses of very small bits. What will happen? All these pulses will excite a fluorescence decay and the real fluorescence decay will be the sum of all these fluorescence decays excited by the individual pulses. So this is the real waveform 
of the fluorescence excited by the laser pulse. We measure this with a detector of finite speed. Again, we can say we break down the detector response into a number of smaller pulses. Then every of these sub pulses of the detector response will see one of these waveforms. The sum of these waveforms is the waveform we record with our flame system. So we combine this and this into a common laser instrument response function called IRF. If you break this down into sub pulses, fluorescence waveform of the excited signal. So this is convolution and this is the IRF. So fine, we know how to do this and it sounds simple, but there's still a problem because we have this wonderful convolution integral, but it's not possible to mathematically reverse this integral. So no way to find out what the real fluorescence uh, function is if we have the measured function and the instrument response function. So ex except for a, very, uh, for a few very special cases, there's no analytical solution for that. So we have to resort to some kind of fitting procedure. You all know what the uh, least square fit is. Actually, you, you have a model function. This is the red curve here. You compare the value in the model function with a measured photon number in this time channel. You square the difference, sum up all the differences, and this gives you a measure of how accurately the decay function, uh, the, the model function uh, matches the fluorescence decay. So this works very well at high photon number. At, at medium photon number, it, it still looks reasonably okay. But in, when the photon number becomes very low, you run into a problem, as you see here on the right. So the reason is that the least square fit is not able to take into account that the photon number is Poisson distributed. So it's impossible to provide a correct weighting of the deviations in the individual time channels, and you don't get the optimal, optimum signal to noise ratio of the tau. And what also happens, you see it here, the tau, the lifetime is biased towards lower values if you have low photon numbers. This is not what we want. So what can we do? The solution is the maximum likelihood estimation algorithm. Let's assume the red curve again is our model function. The blue dots are photon numbers in the time channels of our fluorescence decay. We take the, the, the value from our model function and construct a Poisson distribution, which has exactly this value as an expectation value. Then we take the photon number in this channel put it also in the in the uh, in the photon in, in the Poisson distribution and we can find out how probable it is that we find this photon numbers uh, sorry this that we find this photon number in this time channel what is this what is this probability what we do then is we do this for all time channels determine all these probabilities, we sum up, better we, we multiply all these probabilities, we get a probability that our model function fits the data, and then we optimize the model parameters until this probability is maximum. So that, in other words, the, the maximum likelihood estimation takes into account that the photon numbers are Poisson distributed, and it has, in particular, it has no problem if the photon number is low. It even has no problem if the photon number in some channels is zero, because there's always a non-zero probability of a photon number of zero in the, in the Poisson distribution. So here's an example. Fluorescence decay with low photon number. Actually, this, as you see here, it doesn't really look like a fluorescence decay. This is more like one photon, no photon. Least square fit delivers 1,590 picoseconds. The correct value obtained by a maximum likelihood estimation is 1,960 picoseconds. So much better. So we have to solve the problem of low photon number. So what else do we need? 
I'm always talking about the instrument response function, but I haven't told you how we get it. And this is indeed a problem. The usual advice is that you measure the instrument response function, but in fact, this is impossible in a normal laser scanning microscope for several reasons. First, there is no infinitely fast fluorescence. Simply such effects don't exist. Backscattered or back reflected light doesn't pass through the dichroics and filters of the system. And second harmonic generation, as you can obtain in, in a multi-photon system, goes in the wrong direction. So it's almost impossible to get a, a correct IRF. And I say from my experience, 90% of all measured IRFs are simply wrong. So can we do better? So our approach is we look for a function, mathematical function, which has the same general shape as our typical instrument response function. This is the instrument response function. And this is a function x times e power minus x, simply mathematical function. You see it has the same general shape, not exactly, but close enough. So we have to convert this into a waveform over time, then it looks uh, it uh, looks rather like that. It becomes t divided by t0 times e minus t over t0. But this, you see in general, this is the same function as here. And the recipe is now, we run a normal fit of our decay data using this IRF, but we include the parameter t0 in the fit. What we then get is a parameter t0 which gives the optimum fit for our selected model function. And when we know T0, we, can, we have our instrument response function, we have a mathematical expression of it, and we can use this IRF for further data analysis. And this works surprisingly well. Here are a couple of examples. This is a strongly multi-exponential decay. This is our modeled IRF function. You see how, how nicely the convolution of the model function with, with this IRF matches the data. This is the same thing for a slow single exponential decay. So this works well. And it's even more surprising that the whole thing is working even for extremely fast fluorescence decays. This is an, an example. This is a decay function of mushroom spores. And the interesting thing is there is a lifetime component, which is only 17 picoseconds. And even for such data, our IRF modeling delivers a reasonable IRF and it delivers the correct lifetimes of these mushroom spores. So second point is solved, we have an IRF. What problems else do we have? One of the most frequently encountered problems is not enough photons. I would say for good film analysis, you can't have too many photons, you always have no. So what can we do? When we record an image, especially in microscopy, but it happens by, uh, for image recording through any optical system, the image is blurred by the point spread function. Point spread function is caused by diffraction of the light in the aperture of the optics. So to get a good image, the rule is that the, that the point spread function needs to be oversampled. So the rule is, you can look it up in, in Jim Paulday's book, it should be sampled by something like five by five points. You do this automatically because an undersampled image looks ugly, you automatically oversample. So of course, if you determine the lifetimes in all these pixels simultaneously, you get the same value because everything is, is, is mixed around by by diffraction. So we can bin this area, in this case, five by five, and determine the lifetime there. So in SPC image, we do this by overlapping binning. So in other words, binning does not reduce the effective number of pixels. It only gets the decay information from a larger area around the current pixel. So here's an example. This is no binning. You see the result is noisy. This is binning five by five, same as I suggested here. You see the image is very good, no noise in the lifetime. And if you, even if you go up for binning nine by nine pixels, it essentially looks the same, only if you look into very fine details, 
look into this this feature here it looks like a store this here the colors have blurred a little bit out compared to this that means nine binning nine by nine was too much so i'm perfectly aware that many people disapprove of binning they just think we are losing information by that but in fact correct binning is the way to beautiful lifetime images the alternative to binning in in data analysis would be binning in data acquisition in other words you would have to record the photons in a smaller number of pixels if you do that you get more photons in every pixel but you have a very poor resolution this is an image with 128 by 128 pixels so it has a wonderful decay data in the pixels you get you put accuracy of the lifetime but the image looks blurry if you record the same thing with 512 by 512 pixels and with the same average photon rate with the same laser power with the same acquisition time and you use binning in the lifetime analysis you get the same number of effective same effective number of photons in the pixels but you have 512 by 512 pixels now compare these two images uh, sorry this always doesn't work so compare the two images i leave it to you to decide which image is better so in fact binning in the lifetime analysis does not waste information it's rather in a way to gain additional information in these cases it gains special resolution okay another problem i know with urge you to record data with higher numbers of pixels but you may object okay if i have large flim data sets with many pixels and many time channels the processing times are extremely long and you're actually right so if you process an image like that this processing this image on the cpu of a fast computer takes three minutes and this is still fast because as you see here many of the pixels don't contain photons so the data analysis does not have to analyze all these individual pixels this can it skips the dark pixels so an image like that can take three to eight minutes and larger images can take 10 to 20 minutes to be analyzed so this is this is long and actually it's unacceptably long so what can we do use a gpu a gpu is a graphics processing unit and this is a, a piece of hardware which contains an array of little computers it's designed for image analysis and especially it's assigned for for processing tasks which have to run the same kind of operation in many many pixels of an image so it's an array of many little computers the individual computers may not have a very com comfortable instruction set but because there are so many and they're running in parallel the computation time goes dramatically down we are uh, analyze the same image on a GPU, even on a cheap $100 GPU, it takes less than 10 seconds compared to three minutes here. And even on the GPU of my laptop, the, recently there are laptops which have GPUs implemented, it's less than 10 seconds. Less than 10 seconds. If you spend a little bit more money for $1,000, dollars you get a gpu which runs the same operation in two seconds and if you spend five thousand dollars i can't tell exactly how fast it is probably faster than a second so speed problem also solved if you put this all together maximum likelihood correct irf correct binning gpu processing you are able to record and analyze wonderful images i couldn't resist to show you some of them this is a Artemia salinas. This is a little little water animal, a little salt water shrimp. This is autofluorescence image, lifetime. This is lifetime of the fast component. This is lifetime of the of the slow component. This is the amplitude ratio of the two components. This is metabolic flim, live cells, 
fast component, slow component, amplitude ratio. In these, in, in these things, we saw for the first time that diff different mitochondria in cells may be totally different in the component lifetimes and also in the amplitude ratio. So obviously the, the metabolism is not exactly the same in, in different mitochondria. Here's a FRET example, double exponential decay analysis. The result is you get classic FRET efficiency. You get the FRET efficiency of the interacting donor. You get the donor acceptor distance and you get the fraction of interacting donor. So wonderful images. But still, it can happen that you don't have enough photons. What can we do here? Use the phaser plot. This is actually the point where, our, where in our software the phaser plot kicks in. So what is the phaser plot? You get the phaser plot if you take the decay functions of the individual pixels in the time domain image and Fourier transform them. What you get then is for every decay function, you get a pointer. The pointer has a phase angle, which is, ah, the mouse is different to use, which is this angle, and it gets a magnitude, which is the distance from here to here. And if you have different objects of different decay signature, then you see that these objects form different clusters in the phase of it. Good, how can we use it? Here's an image of a cell. Let's assume we're interested in the fluorescence decay of the mitochondria. But our, flu our photon number in the individual pixels is terribly low. So what can we do? Load the data in the phase of plot. Select an area in the phase of plot, which approximately corresponds to the color, that means the decay time of the mitochondria in the time domain image. Back annotate the selected pixel in the time domain image. And sure enough, we're selecting the mitochondria. That's good. And in the next step, we sum the decay curves of all pixels, which we have selected here, up. And we get a beautiful fluorescence decay curve, which contains more than 3 million photons compared to something like 200 in the individual pixels. So that's good. What can we use it as well? And a common problem is actually decay analysis in moving objects. You know, many people say this, it's impossible by TCSPC flint because the, the, the acquisition times are too long. So this is an example. This is the leg of a live water flea. And these are 0.5 second scans from a larger, taken from a larger time series, you see the leg is moving. Sometimes you get a reasonable image of the leg, sometimes it's totally dis uh, distorted. And because we recorded only for 0.5 seconds, the photon number is terribly low. You see, this the images contain a lot of noise. So, okay, combination with the phase of plot, we load all the little images from the entire time series into SPC image. As you see here, the photon number in individual pixels are low. We see this, okay, this is maybe it's a, a double exponential decay, but we can't say it for sure. So next, we open the phaser plot. We select a phaser range, which corresponds to the color of the leg in the time domain images. Back annotate them and we see, okay, fine. We selected the leg, that's good. And we combine the photons in all these individual images of the water flea leg. And we get a fluorescence decay, which contains almost 6 million photons. This can be analyzed at extremely high precision. And if you are an expert in, <clears throat> in metabolic flip, you will see immediately, this is the fluorescence decay of FAD, you will also see that the, the fluorescence decay times and also the ratio of A1 and A2 correspond to a type of metabolism which is driven by, by oxidative phosphorylation, 
In other terms, the water flea has no cancer and it's, it's running normal metabolism. So this is metabolic phlegm on the leg of a moving water flea. That's what DCSPC image, the TSPC image, next generation can do for us. And this is what I would recommend you to try. I have noticed that there's, there's a lot of, of more little items I would be tempted to talk about, but time is limited. So I should suggest you look into our literature. We have a lot of, the, of, of it and it's always free. You can download it from our, from our website. So at the end, I shouldn't forget to thank our users of SPC image, which have used it successfully for almost two decades. There are so many that I actually can't list them here, just global thanks to the SPC image community. I should also thank the science organizations, which have provided financial support to us and our users. And I'm thanking you for watching this presentation. I hope I will just see you next year again in the same conference, and I hope I will see you personally that the epidemic will be over. So thank you once more.